Labeling metal enclosures is a challenge with which, if you build electronics, you are undoubtedly familiar. Paint doesn't adhere well, markers rub off, and decals change the appearance entirely. The classic solution is the old Dymo hand labeler, but if you've taken pride in building your project, why not put in just a little extra effort and etch the face with your own design? Etching an enclosure is just like etching a PCB, but a little bit trickier to get right. Aluminum is a temperamental material and requires some special handling. But with a little bit of practice and patience, you can etch with excellent results. The first challenge is the toner transfer. First, we need to sand down the enclosure. Aluminum dust isn't good for your eyes or lungs, so be sure to protect them. The initial surface when you get it from the factory will be rough and the grains will be visible. You want to smooth these out. I start with an orbital sander at around 120 grit and then scale up to about 200 or 240. The surface isn't always perfectly flat, it might be a little bit convex, especially on the back and sides, so this can take a minute. After that, we can finish it off with some high grit sandpaper. We alternate grains perpendicular to one another so that you can't see the scratches from one and the grain of the next. When you get to about a thousand grit or more, you should have a nice almost mirror-like finish. The smoother it is, the easier it is to do the toner transfer. Next, we follow the same steps as with the PCB. Print it out on glossy laser printer paper in reverse so that when you flip it over, it's the right way around. Now, I'm going to show you a couple mistakes that I made so that you can learn by watching instead of doing it. Notice how I taped the transfer to the enclosure. Avoid this if you can because tape has a tendency to melt the adhesive and get sticky and just interfere with the thermal transfer of the toner. Doing this on an enclosure is a little more difficult because the thermal mass of the aluminum is greater than that of the copper on a blank board. This draws heat away from the toner, making it less likely to fuse. Next, notice how I just dunk the enclosure straight into the water after it's done. And you can see how bubbles form underneath the surface of the transfer. The bubbles pull the paper away and make it less likely to adhere. Finally, notice how I just peel the paper away at a corner, and the toner seems to come up with the paper. If the transfer fails, wipe it up with acetone and start again. I should mention at this point that many have recommended using wax-coated sticker backing paper instead of laser printer paper. Your results may vary, but I'll show you how I got this method to work. We begin by heating the enclosure itself so that the thermal mass is hot when we apply the transfer. Next, without any tape, we take the bare transfer and gently stick it on, being careful not to burn ourselves. The heat from the enclosure melts the plastic toner and acts as an adhesive of its own, fusing it directly as you apply it. It's very important to make sure that the transfer is on straight and flat because there's no going back from here. Then, with a piece of cloth as a buffer, simply set the iron on top of the enclosure for about a minute or so. After that, it's a matter of using the same procedure as before, with the tip of the iron and applying even pressure on the whole surface of the transfer. Then we can apply a bit of water and cut some grooves into the paper with an X-Acto knife so that when it soaks through, it doesn't form bubbles underneath the surface. After a few minutes in the water, the transfer is basically soaked through and we can remove the paper backing. This time, we don't peel it up from the corner, we'll start in the middle and actually try and break through the paper fibers gently. This takes a little while, but after we get through the first layer, it gets easier and easier to pull the remaining ones off. The paper gets soaked all the way through, and where there isn't any toner to adhere it to the metal, it simply disintegrates into the solution. As you get to areas with fine detail, you might use a toothbrush or another small implement to help you remove the paper fibers without damaging the toner. When it's all done, you should be able to see the shiny metal surface underneath, and then the dull toner with paper backing still adhered to it, covering up the parts that you don't want etched. Now is a good time to cover up any remaining bits that didn't get successfully transferred with nail polish, or a sharpie marker. Additionally, it's a good time to mask off the areas that you just don't want etched at all, like the back and sides. You don't have to mask off the inside unless you're planning to submerge it entirely in etching. You can use any plastic tape, but packaging tape works really well. Next, it's time to prepare your etchant solution. It stains everything, so be sure to protect your surfaces. Add the liquid component to a tray that's big enough to hold the enclosure, and then stir in the solid component. I'm using some leftover etchant from a PCB and adding some fresh ferric chloride. The strength of your solution greatly determines the speed with which it will etch, and also the depth that you can achieve. 
If we apply a small amount of etchant to the surface, we can see it react. When we wipe it up, we can see the color change left behind and get an idea of what the etch will look like. When we're ready to etch, dunk the entire enclosure surface face down into the tub and agitate it so that the etchant washes over the surface evenly. When we take it out of the tray, we can both see and hear the etchant reaction occurring. This is a good way to get an idea of how strong your solution is. If we wipe it up, we can see the color change very dramatically underneath the surface. However, this is probably not what the final result will look like. After a few minutes, or maybe even a little bit longer, if you're looking for a really deep etch, you remove the enclosure and wipe it clean with a wet rag to make sure we've removed all of the etchant and completely stopped the reaction. Make sure to store your leftover etchant and label it properly in a glass or plastic jar. The copper ions from etching PCBs are hazardous to groundwater, so don't dump it down the drain. At last, it's time to remove the toner mask and see what it looks like underneath. We apply some acetone, a rag or a paper towel, and scrub the surface until the toner starts to disappear and reveal the aluminum underneath. You can see that the leftover copper ions in my etchant left this interesting reddish-brown color in the etched areas. At the edge of the enclosure, where the reaction was apparently stronger, it actually changed the texture a little bit, leaving it rough and almost corroded. This can be desirable if you want to fill the etch with black paint, for example. Notice how much different the color is on the left, which is an etch done with fresh ferric chloride. Unlike screen printing or water slide decals, every etched enclosure is unique and impossible to duplicate. That, to be honest, is a lot of what I like about the etching process. Every enclosure, each result, has your unmistakable fingerprints on it. And that is part of what makes a piece of electronics a little bit more like a work of art. Etching enclosures is challenging, but I love the way it looks, and if I can do it, so can you. But I'm sure you can improve on my techniques, so let me know what else you try and how it changes the result. If you enjoyed this tutorial, go ahead and subscribe to see more stuff like it. Thanks for watching. See you next time.